I think that a good place for us to start this evening is to actually take uh, one step backwards into Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. And in Revelation 1, 19, John is given the outline for the book of Revelation. Isn't that exciting? Revelation 1, 19, he writes, well, this is Jesus speaking to John, write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Now, I know that there are a lot of folks who say that the book of Revelation is a difficult book, that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. But I would say to you that those who make those kinds of assertions have really, in many cases, never read the book or are just getting some secondhand ideas out of a movie or something. Uh, but we're going to truly ponder this book as we go through it. And I think that you'll find it lines up in a very easy fashion to follow. So in chapter 1, John has already written down the things that he saw. And what he saw was the risen, glorified Jesus in the midst of his church. And now, that was part one, part two of the book of Revelation happens in chapters two and three. That's where it says, write down the things which are, the things that are happening right now in the church age. So John, fill us in of what's happening now. And I believe that that, as we'll see, is a continuum of all the time of the church age. It's, it's talking about the things that are the age of grace. Does anybody here like it that we're sitting in an age of grace? Oh, yeah. How wonderful it is that, that Jesus just says, you know, let's make this clear. Anybody who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Don't you like that? I mean, we're talking about a total open door policy that Jesus has and has won for us. And I, I just think this age of grace is awesome. That's chapters two and three. And then, starting in chapter 4, to the end of the book, write down the things which will take place, so future things, the things that will take place after, what? After what? After the church age. After the grace age. And that, of course, would be, it's coming. The coming judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, I know those of us sitting here with faith in Christ scratch our heads and we'd say, why on, the, why on earth would people pass up on forgiveness? I mean, come on! Why on earth would people pass on a love relationship with God? And so we're kind of shocked by it because we've given our lives to Christ. It's our delight to know Him and to serve Him all the more. So... We know that that's coming. Judgment is for real. It's for sure. It is absolutely coming. But guess what? It is absolutely avoidable. Do you like that? Judgment is sure, but you can surely avoid it. And that's through Christ Jesus. So that's the outline that Jesus gave to John. And today, then, we begin the section of the things that are. So we're actually going to get seven letters. Jesus has... John basically take dictation. John, I'm going to dictate seven letters, and they're going to go to seven churches, seven particular churches. Kind of interesting. I don't know if you can imagine for just a moment, the back doors fly open, and in walks uh, an angel, and he's dressed in a U.S. post office outfit with slits in the back for the wings. But anyway, <laughs> he walks in, and, and he says, uh, special delivery letter for Calvary Chapel Life of Huntington Beach. And we go, well, wow, sure. Here, give me the letter. Who's it from? It's from Jesus. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? I mean, we love reading the Gospels with the red letters. Well, here comes a red letter letter from Jesus to the churches. Now, uh, it's a letter 
that is coming from the person that we saw, magnificent being that we saw, the one place in the Bible that actually gives a description of what Jesus looks like. You know, I asked a group of people, uh, I kind of tricked them, but anyway, I said, who here knows where in the Bible that there's a description of what Jesus looks like? They all just kind of looked at me like, I don't know any place like that. And then finally somebody says, the book of Revelation. Absolutely. Because if you'll remember, John hears a voice. The voice sounded like a trumpet. <laughs> sounded like a trumpet. It wasn't a trumpet, but it sounded like a trumpet. In fact, it, it sounded like something else. The voice of many waters. So both those sounds are sounds that are unmistakable, undeniable. They cut through it. That's who this letter is from. Not only with a voice like that, but this person has God words coming from them. Literally, God words, God breathed words <laughs> that come from him, and that's signified by a double, you know, two edged sword. Uh, his eyes are a flame of fire. I can either scare you or warm your heart. One of the two. It tells you that he sees everything. And he judges everything absolutely right. He's wearing royal robes or robes of a high priest. Either way, he has a gold band. His feet are of molten brass. You know, this is his face is white. His hair is white, speaking of his absolute purity. And of course, when John sees this, who remembers what John did? He, he, he fell over like a dead man. Do you blame him? <laughs> and then Jesus all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise, all-loving Jesus, what does he do to John? He puts his hand on him. Oh, man, that touch of Jesus. There's nothing like a touch from Jesus, right? A touch from Jesus, and he says to John, don't be afraid, fear not. And then he says, because look, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I have the keys to help. Don't worry about that, John. I've got all this handled. I've got the whole situation handled. So, uh, another way to look at these letters, going to specific churches, but I'm telling you that these seven letters are written to all of us, to all churches of all time, ever. It's written to individuals. There are applications in here that are absolutely necessary, dynamic, powerful for our walk with Jesus Christ. I, I, I've said this before too, I'll probably say it a few more times. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a lover of Jesus Christ, you must go to the book of Revelation. I can't see any other way of that happening. There is a book in the Bible that says, this book reveals who Jesus is. <laughs> so if you're a lover of Jesus Christ, you have to go to this book to find out exactly who he is. Here's why I know that it can fit us all. Because each of these letters have an exhortation. Each of them have a motivation. Each of them have a blessing, a promise. That's to all of us. But each one of these letters ends with these words. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Do you have ears? And that ears is the metaphor for you have the ability to understand words. And he's like, okay, this is for you. If you have an ear, tune it in and listen. All right, uh, let's talk for a moment about the city of Ephesus, because this is the first letter it's written to Ephesus. You can see that. Ephesus was considered a jewel of the Roman Empire. Ephesus was the metropolis of Asia, is what it was called. The most spectacular ruins can still be found there today. It has an amphitheater, which is spoken of in the book of Acts, chapter 19. The amphitheater that they will, built way back when, it's still there. And it seats 25,000 people. This was really some kind of a place. It had one of the greatest libraries of the ancient world, if not the greatest library, because it had over 200 thousand books you say well 200,000 books that's not very much this is before typewriters and computers and coffee machines and printers 200,000 books 
It was a business location. It had trade. It had commerce. It included banking. One of the largest banks in Europe was there. Uh, it was considered, and still is to today, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. There's the Temple of Diana is there. The Temple of Diana is the goddess of sexuality and fertility. Now, the name Ephesus is a great name. I've never dedicated a baby named Ephesus, but here's the meaning of that word Ephesus. It literally means darling. So when Jesus says, write to my darling, isn't that great? It, it could also mean beloved or sweetheart. It actually speaks of a romantic kind of love, which you'll see fits in really well with this teaching. The church of, I was thinking of starting to call my wife my Ephesus, but anyway. Uh, this church was started by the Apostle Paul. So he's the church planner that got this whole thing going. The Apostle Paul was there three years, and he also uh, started a Bible college that came out of this church. I mean, if you want to pick some place where it's really things are going on, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, lived her last days there. John was there after the island of Patmos. He goes back to Ephesus and he stays there until he dies. What a church. Uh, so let's see. It was a coastal city, a beautiful location, lots of commerce going on. There was a whole lot of things to see and to do. It was kind of a cultural center, and the people of that city were out seeking their bliss. My goodness, it sounds a lot like Heinz and Beach, doesn't it? So let's get right into it. Verse 1, let's go. This is the letter that John takes dictation. Jesus says, To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, signification of power, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Somebody tell me, who is that? It's Jesus, isn't it? Now, see where it says to the angel? That word angel is the Greek word angelos, which is translated messenger. Now, there are some folks who just say, oh, it's the messenger to the church. That must mean it's the pastor of the church because the pastor is the one who gives the message. Interesting, but I kind of lean towards it being an actual angel. The reason why I say that is because every other place in the book of Revelation where the word angelos is used it's referring to a literal angel. But either way that you look at it, it's fine. I love it that Jesus is found where? He's found with his church. Ever heard a Christian that doesn't go to church? Or ever talk to somebody who says, I don't go to church? I, I find that surprising. Because if you're somebody who walks with Jesus, then I need to tell you where Jesus is. Jesus is walking in the midst of his church, right? That's where the candle, the candle stands are. That, that, that's the church. And where's Jesus? He's right there in the middle of his church. Jesus would absolutely spend time with his bride, right? It says he, he gave himself so he could find a bride that he could pull out of a corrupt world and make of her a beautiful bride without spot and blemish. So just like any man who has a bride, wants to walk with her, so that just makes sense. Now, uh, here's something amazing as it begins in verse 2. I know your works. Alright, stop right there for a second and just, just hear me out. I know your works. What, I, I don't know, what does that do for you? If Jesus said to you, okay, you get the letter. <laughs> you get the letter at your home. And you get it, and you look at it, and it's addressed to you. In the upper left-hand corner, it says Jesus. <laughs> and uh, postmark is heaven. So anyway, you open it up, and you fill out the letter, and you start to read it. And the first 
four words are from Jesus directly to you is, I know your works. Now, does that bring you comfort or does that bring you discomfort? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes. Remember those eyes of flame of fire. Open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So apparently, Jesus knows everybody's works. And, and as I thought about that, I'll tell you right there and then, at my desk, with my computer open, making notes, I was like, oh Lord, I just, I just want to come running right now to your throne of mercy and grace. I, I bring to you my best efforts, which I know aren't much, and, and I ask that you to continue to work in my life. Right? Isn't that the kind of it makes you humble? It makes you grace and mercy is what I need from God right now. All right, verse two. I know your works, your labor, your patience. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Would you like to get this letter? And that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they're apostles and are not. And have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. If you want to talk about a spiritual report card, huh? Wouldn't you like to get this kind of a spiritual report card? I mean, each one of these things listed down through verse 3, these are things that are all in the plus column. These are things that I'm certain were hard gained. Uh, to have this, these people had to be real disciples. They had to have a determination. They had to have a purposeful walk with Jesus Christ begs the question of us. Do we have a purposeful walk with Jesus Christ? I, I love this because, of course, as a pastor, I couldn't help but think, what kind of letter would we get? What kind of letter would Jesus Christ send us? And as I read this first, verse 1, 2, 3, I thought, I know that there's a lot of folks in this church that work very hard. And I, I just am so grateful for that. And especially with Jesus watching and Jesus knowing. I've seen some really hard workers here. As a matter of fact, as I looked up these words in the Greek, it's not just labored like you did something good. I mean, it is. But if you look at the words in the Greek, you'd be surprised to find that the words speak of laboring to the point of exhaustion. And I know we have some folks like that. In fact, there's some of us that say, hey, you can't want to rest. Take a couple days off, you know, relax. You're really working hard. See, in order to work in the church, you have to have dedication or you're going to burn out in a real hurry. You have to have dedication. You have to have faithfulness. In fact, the one quality that's required of anybody in service to the church Number one, top on the list is faithfulness. You have to hang in there over the long haul. And it takes a connection with Jesus Christ, a walk with Him, a closeness with Him that isn't hit and miss in order to serve in the church. It has to be a kind of walk with Him where you're able to get strength from Him, where you're able to get joy from Him. Because you see, the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Lord Jesus, I am happy to do this for you. Lord Jesus, I just love doing this for you. Working for the Lord is sometimes no picnic. Even if we're having a picnic. Which means that the workers are going to have to work twice as hard during that picnic to make sure everybody's taken care of. Now, if you were to say, Paul the Apostle who planted this church, Ephesus, what did he think about her? I'll tell you. It's in the book of Acts, chapter 20. Listen to what Paul the Apostle says to the church of Ephesus after three years of being with them when he's about to leave and go to Jerusalem and he knows he might never see them again. He says, 
Paul says, I did not shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Good reason for us to go through the Bible cover to cover, don't we think? Verse by verse, chapter by chapter. Paul says to Ephesus, so guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as leaders. I know that false teachers, like Vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave and not spare the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up, distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember, Paul says, for the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day, and my many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of His grace that He is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those He has set apart for Himself. Do you think Paul the Apostle loved the church of Ephesus? Slightly, huh? Do you think Jesus loved the church of Ephesus? More than the Apostle Paul. You think Jesus Christ loves this church? Absolutely. He is sold out in love for this church and the people in it. He wants the very best for you. So he gives us these letters. He gives us kind of an insight as to what it's like to have a home group, what it's like to be an usher, what it's like to be a pastor or a teacher. What is it? that we need to do and to be like. And Jesus says this, I know your works, your labor, your patience. So that's, just, that's just beautiful. We also find out they had discernment. Well, what's discernment? Discernment's just knowing what's good and what's bad, right? Just knowing what's right and what's wrong. You get those things from the Word of God. They saw something that was evil, they didn't put up with it. He's going, you know what? That's not right that you're doing that, bro. Or you may want to do that, but we don't do that here. Not in this church. You're going to have to take that some other place. And that's happened here before. And the people of God, you know, to do whatever they're going to do. You have to have discernment. He's even somebody who claims to be an apostle. And they're not. You could see right through them. You know, years ago, uh, I was listening to a counseling radio call-in show. It was not Dr. Laura, but it was a Christian call-in show. And uh, this lady calls in, and she has a problem. And she's been reading her Bible. And she said, you know, I talked to my pastor, and uh, he does not believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. And I love it that, that the, counseling, the counselor said, uh, let me tell you right off, uh, then he's not telling you about the Jesus of the Bible. And she said, well, I know, but I really don't want to leave there. I've been there a lot of years, and he's a really nice guy. <laughs> Do you think she was going to a church like the Church of Ephesus? Not a chance. You know, you have discernment. You can catch these things. And... And I want to tell you that, you know, the pastor can't do it all for you. I suppose I could go home with you. Especially if you're a good cook. I suppose I could follow your marriage around. Who's that guy sitting in court? That's the pastor. He's going to live with us for a while. You, you, we have to learn how to feed ourselves, right? I mean, at some point, right, you, you, if you're a baby, then you get fed. And that's awesome. You get milk. Milk is a word. That's great. But, but please don't live off of the 45 minutes that you spend with me on a Sunday. And that's your only shot in the arm. Come on. You're not gonna, you barely make it from one Sunday to the next. You know? So you have to learn how to feed yourself and grow in the Word. Spend time with Jesus. So... 
You'd have to say that this is a happening church by practically any measurement that you care to put on it. Or is it? Verse 4. What a verse this is. <clears throat> Nevertheless. Those are staggering words. Just that one word is a staggering word. You know all this great, great stuff you do? Super. Nevertheless, I have this against you. Lord Jesus, you're saying that to your darling, to your beloved, to your sweetheart. I have something against you. How could that be? Ephesus was a busy place. You know, if you were looking for activity, go to that church. If you're looking for good teaching, go there. Sound doctrine, they have it. If you were looking for people with giftedness that was in operation, that's the place. They had it. They could have put verses 1, 2, and 3 as a header on their website. What Jesus thinks about us. Verses 1, 2, 3. They could have put it on Instagram. They could have put it on YouTube. They could have put it on the cover of the church bulletin. What Jesus thinks about us. Huh? I mean, that's awesome what was said. But this all-telling, dynamic verse begins with the word, nevertheless. And I think I have to, I think, I think I have to speak to us in a way in which I want to communicate. Don't rest on your knowledge. Don't, please don't do that. Please don't predicate your Christianity on, on all these doctrinal things that you don't need. Yeah, those things are good. You need to know them. Absolutely you do. But don't rest your weight, your faith, your work, your effort. Don't, none of that. Please don't do that. It's a strong word. It's a needed word. Maybe it's a word for some of us today. Maybe Jesus will tap you on the shoulder today and say, you're my darling, I love you, you've got all these good things going on, nevertheless, I must tell you out of love, nevertheless, I must say to you that despite all the good, the greatest ingredient is not to be found in you. The main thing is no longer the main thing. There's a serious problem here. The issue is grave. It's weighty. Where is the love? Jeannie and I were talking. We went to my son's 40th birthday party, and we're just driving back right now. And it was great. Anyway, we're driving back, and I'm kind of talking to her about what it's about, what the sermon's about. Says, Where is the love? And both of us right away started singing, Where is the love? <laughs> but that's the kind of idea that's here, isn't it? Jesus is like, where, where's the love? There's something missing. This would be like, okay, let me see if I can think. Okay, this would like be trying to have a donut without the dough. Uh, this would be like trying to be a frog without the ribbon. <laughs> Okay, I'm doing these things on the spot. <laughs> what else would it be like? What? Where's the beef? Where's the beef? <laughs> what else? It's like what? Peanut butter without jelly. Peanut butter without the jelly. Mac, no cheese. Mac without cheese. <laughs> hey, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's a serious problem. Where's the love? And we may need to ask ourselves that question, where is the love? Because Jesus is right now, the Jesus that's explained in chapter 1, the, the, the description of him, i got to tell you this, that Jesus that's in chapter 1, he is seeing right this moment into your heart and mind. And is he saying to you, where's the love? My darling, where's the love? Oh, you got everything else?
once looks, you're together. Sweet new Bible you got. You can, you can talk it with the best of them. Where's the love? Open to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to read three verses, just three verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1, 2, and 3. Love chapter. Paul the Apostle writes, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who inspired and helped John to write Revelation, writes, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. I mean, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> How many languages do you know? Well, counting angel, that would be, you know, 40 whatever. <laughs> Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand, check this out, I have the gift of prophecy and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains. Scoot over a mountain. You're blocking my sunset. And have not love. What does it say? I am nothing. Now let me give you the literal translation of nothing. No thing. I mean, we could be impressed with somebody who, I'm now going to bring up a special guest speaker tonight who knows all mysteries and all knowledge and all faith and can move mountains. You'd be impressed. I'd be impressed. Jesus would not be impressed if that person did not have love. Look at verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, I mean, what would that take? I don't care what they do. And believe me, there are some Christians who have been burned a lot. How many of them? ISIS has done it to some Christians. Though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Dear Ephesus, where has your love gone? Did you know that the Bible says that one of the signs of the end times is that, you ready for this? The love of many will grow cold. What kind of age are we living in right now? This is the age of rage, isn't it? Everybody is like, we're after everybody. You're to look different in this age of rage. In this age of rage, you're to be the one who has love. You're to be the one where people look at you and go, what is up with you? What do you have? What in the, why? I don't get you. And that's what you can say. I used to be like you. Well, actually not like you. I was actually worse than you. But then I met Jesus. Did you know Jesus is alive? And he's powerful. And he's coming back again. And every single person will have an eye-to-eye -eye encounter with the glorified, risen Savior Everybody in this room right now is moving towards an, an appointment. The greatest appointment that your life will ever have. And that's where you're standing here and Jesus is standing here and he's looking at you. I don't know, well, I don't know what greater thing I can tell you. That what's coming in your life is that. Now you tell me, what does he see right now? The one with the eyes of the flame of fire doesn't miss every, anything, can judge absolutely everything. What does he see right now? It's part of what gave me a rough week this past week. <laughs> As I was studying, I was like, I was like you know, par partial joy and then partial, what would you have me do different, Lord? I, yeah, look, 
if, if we really get this, if, if we really get this, don't you think your life would be different? I mean, if you really understood this, don't you think you'd be different? I think, I think we would. I think our prayer life would change because we would know standing right next to us, walking in the midst of the church, walking right down this aisle, center aisle, right in the midst of us, is this Jesus all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, all-merciful, all-judging, is coming back again. I, I need to catch a vision of that Jesus. I mean, I love Christmas, and I love the baby in the manger. So do people who don't love the grown-up Jesus. But this is the grown-up Jesus, died on a cross, buried three days, rose from the grave, is now seated at the right hand of the Father, not only seated at the right hand of the Father, which speaks of his, his anointed position, but he also is walking in the midst of his church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that, that, that should cause us to think some things. That should cause us to stop. Ever heard of that church member who's ready to rip on another church? Ever run across that? Have you ever run into the unforgiving Christian? Have you ever wanted to run away screaming from the gossiper who just goes on and on and on. Ever heard the church that proudly speaks of their doctrine as being so high and lofty that everybody else is much lower than they are? Ever been around a campfire when it's just about to go out and the last little embers there are just dying? That is when Jesus Christ was seeing when he looked into the heart of the church of Ephesus. He was seeing the last coals of love beginning to die out. I, I can't think of much sadder than that. It must have been hard on Jesus, don't you think? Imagine the human heart looking like that in the eyes of Jesus. We should say, Lord Jesus, don't, don't let that last little ember in me go out. Holy Spirit, breathe across the embers of my heart and my love for you. Here's another stark realization that I had. Notice the wording. It says, it doesn't say that you've lost your first love. It says you have left your first love. That means that this is sin. You didn't walk away. You left it. Is your life busy? Mine is. Is your life filled with activity? Is your life stressful? Are you taking full advantage of God's love in your life? Let God, let God love you. I, I, I can't tell you anything. You, God flat out loved you. This incredible being went to this incredible length so that he could have a friendship with you. I was trying to, I was trying to last week, and some people know this at the midweek study, I was trying to think of, if I were to try to boil everything down, you know, everything that we do and, and study and all, what, what, what's this all about? What is this Christianity thing all about? And, and, and I'm boiling it down, down, down. I was like, Lord, give me kind of like one line of what, what, what it is. You know what it all is? It's having a love relationship with God. That, 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 does that about say it? It's all about a love relationship with God. Uh, there's a song that we're going to do next week, an old Keep Green song, and it has these words in it. Oh Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. Look at verse 5. Jesus isn't going to leave him in that condition. 
and he would not leave any of us in that condition. Here's his prescription. Dr. Jesus, what's the prescription? Here it is. Verse 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That church could have gone on as an organization. Anybody ever heard of the YMCA? What does that stand for? Young Men's Christian Association. YMCA was all Christian. Now it's all not Christian. It's continuing on as an organization, but it's not Christian. It's the YMCA. Pretty sad, don't you think? It lost it somewhere along the road. The lamp of that light of that organization got moved someplace. Jesus is not there. So step one, step three-step plan. Step one, remember how it used to be. That's what you're supposed to do. Remember how it used to be. Anybody here remember what it's like when you first got saved? I mean, I I, I, I'm going to give you uh, two really big things that happened to me. I was in high school. Uh, I'm driving my Volkswagen. Uh, I'm going up over an overpass. Uh, there's a sunset. And I catch this sunset. There's the sunset. And I looked at that sunset and I was like, I know who did that. It was like a huge thing to me, you know? I know who did that. I was like blown away. The other one, what was really impacting in my life is I picked up the Bible. And I was reading in the Gospels. And I had this thought, which was, I know who wrote this. He, he's a friend of mine. The one who wrote this, I know him. It was extraordinary for me to have that experience, you know? There was a time in my life, you could ask my mom, sitting right there, where she was worried about me. Uh, well, geez, this is just one of the many times she was worried about me. But, uh, she was worried about me because I was like, I couldn't get enough of the Bible. And I was like going to a Bible study every single night of the week. I'd find a Bible study someplace. And then I would even go on lunch break on, on, on Friday. So I would go to Bible study. I just couldn't get enough of the Word. And she says, are you okay, Michael? And, and, yeah. And she's like, oh, well, maybe you should go to the movies. <laughs> Anyway, I just couldn't get enough of the Word of God. And then when I would pray, I would feel like, I mean, this is a trip. I'm, this, I'm just tripped out. I'm just tripped out that Jesus is listening to me right now. And I'd be like, and all, he, Jesus, he, I get, I'm going to talk to him. Excuse me, I love you, but I, I want to spend some time with Jesus. Not just to ask him for stuff, but a lot, a lot of it had to do with just thankfulness. And to this day, I'm still, you know, blown away. I, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. I'm so, I don't know of a single day when I can't think about that and just be floored. I, I can. I can me. I can walk into the very throne room of God with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I feel like I'm sneaking in, you know. <laughs> but I've got the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and God goes, "That's my son." You can walk into the very holy of holies. Anybody else would be wiped out. Not you. And God will go, "That's my daughter. I love her." She's going to be with me for all eternity. Oh, this is so good. In fact, when, 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 I, when I see her, I'm going to have this big wedding feast. We, we just, uh, how long have you been married now, Richie? Two and a half months. Two and a half months. <laughs> you, should, <laughs> you should have seen this guy 
started dancing at his wedding feast. Oh my gosh, he was grooving, man. <laughs> he had it. He. I've never seen Richie smile that much. He, you know, he had this. He had this. The only time he wasn't smiling is when he first saw his bride come down the aisle. I thought he was going to cry. I totally get that. I don't totally get that. That's how Jesus feels about you. Did you? <laughs> That's awesome. He's in love with you. And they forgot. And Jesus is like, don't you remember? Do you remember? And then part two. Step two, what does he say? Remember, therefore, from when you have fallen. What's the next word? Number two is repent. Literally, the word repent means change your mind. Turn around. Make a U-turn. It's legal. A legal U-turn here. Repentance in... Okay, I, I, was, I was like everybody else. I had repent, repent. Oh, what a funny word. You know? Oh, yeah. Repentance. But you know what I think about now when I think of the word repent? <coughs> Repentance? I think it's like God giving you the golden key to the city. You get to repent. You can repent every day if you like. You can repent right now where you're sitting. Just, I don't care what you've been doing or where you've been or how you've been thinking, you can turn from that right now and you can embrace the God who loves you. Amen. What a gift. The most it's tremendous gift from God to give us the ability to repent at any moment. Step three. Repeat. <laughs> Do the first works. Hit the redo button. Remember, repent and repeat. Repeat what? It says do the first works. What were the first works? The first works were for me all about belief. The first works for me were all about thank you God. Thank you Lord. I have just Filled with this gratitude. Thank you. Sometimes we can turn into complaint machines. Got any of those here? Now listen, God. If you're really God, I want you to take care of the first 30 things on this list. Have those done by Friday. We'll talk then. See you later. Oh, you've been there. <laughs> Me too. My, your whole life becomes this thing you're giving God a laundry list. Imagine if that if that Jesus in chapter 1 walked through that door right now. Shining like the sun. This S-O-N shining like the S-U-N with purity and eyes of fire and white robe and red gold sash. What would you say to him? Now, why can't you help me get a better parking spot in the mall? <laughs> would, that, would that be it? Now, let me tell you about some of your other followers. Would that be it? Or would you be my job? Lord! Lord Jesus, I love you. I, I love you, Lord. Look at verse well, the end of verse uh, 6. Or I'll come quickly and remove you from the lamps there, unless you repeat. See, Jesus is not going to stay in a church that doesn't have love. I just think it's, it's, it's not home to him. A place without love, it's just not home to him. Verse 6 says, But you have this. <laughs> but this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. All right, so much for Jesus meek and mild. Did you know that there are some things that Jesus hates? Perfect God can have perfect hate. And this perfect God has perfect hate. 
and he hated this thing that the Nicolaitans were doing. If you take the two words, Nicolaity, it means some kind of a overlord or some kind of a priesthood that's over the laity. So the leaders thought they were really something and everybody else was below them. Did you know that the ground at the foot of the cross is? Level. Level. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So there is no over, you know, whatever. Here's what uh, one commentator put it like this. They laid claim to special position and power with God, but they lived like the devil. <laughs> wow. That's the Nicolaitans. The Ephesians hated it. Jesus hated it. And so should we hate it. Don't say it and not live it. We all fall, we all have feet of clay, but don't talk it and not walk it. Verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's plural. All churches. To him who overcomes. Overcomes what? In the context of this letter, it's the one who overcomes the cold, shallow, work-based religion. If you're resting on the fact, you know, don't stand in front of Jesus the last time and say, let me in because, you know, after all, I went to Calvary Chapel Life. <laughs> that 50 cents won't, won't get you a cup of coffee. Right? You know it. You know it. Closely, intimately. I love you, Jesus. I love you. Here's your own. Tonight, when you're laying in bed before you go to sleep, I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I love you. And anything else that I've done that's not out of my love for you, will you please now forgive me? I don't want you to have a nevertheless in my life. Jesus, forgive me. I will give to eat from the tree of life. I'm going to hold that tasty little thing until we get to Revelation chapter 22. We'll talk about the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Originally, the word paradise meant a garden of delight. But eventually, it came to mean the place where God dwells. The place where God lives. That's paradise. Jesus says, you're going to be with me, all you overcomers who now live on love with me and not live on works for me. Will you do works? Absolutely. Out of love. The bottom line of this message, as we close, the bottom line of this message is asking you, here's the ask, you ready? I'm asking you to fall in love with Jesus. That's what this is all about. Will you fall in love with the God who made you, with the God who loves you, and gave of His own Son so that that was, that was a demonstration of God pursuing after you. God pursued after you, so now you can pursue after Him. And that's what God is asking of us. Will you fall in love with Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this letter to the church that you that really this church is your darling. You love them and you miss their loving you back. Lord, there are churches today who you love and you miss their loving you back. There are people today, perhaps some in this sanctuary, who you love and you miss their loving you back. Lord Jesus, switch us around. Help us to repent and to return to you and to go back to that place of our first love. Holy Spirit, we you convict hearts right now. Touch lives. Hold us in. Who are our prayers today? Come on. 
David and Shannon are going to be up front. They would love to pray for you, to pray with you. You need a touch from God. You need forgiveness from God. You want to dedicate your life to a beautiful life from this teaching to be able to do that. Father, do a work so that we'll know it's a work only you can do. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone says, Amen. Let's